And why isn't federal immigration law tougher on border crossers who come here and are accused of serious crimes? So, um, are you speaking of a specific case? There's this story in New York, an eight-person crew of border crossers found with drugs and guns. Six of them now are out on bail. Does President Biden think policies like that are making the country safer? So I want to be really careful. That's an active case, so don't want to comment on an active case. But anyone found guilty, and we've been very clear about that, anyone found guilty of a crime should be held accountable. We have been very, very clear about that. Whenever they say they've been very clear, that's a, that's a good sign they're lying and I haven't been clear about anything. Joining me now, Adam B. Coleman, author of the book, Black Victim to Black Victor. Adam, they've been very clear. They've been very clear that they want the border open. What seems to confuse so many people on the right is why. Why do these people want the country flooded with illegals? Um, you know, I, I think, that's that's even a question I sometimes have a hard trouble answering, um, because sometimes I think it's malicious and sometimes I think it's just incompetence. And I often think the type of issues that we see coming from, especially Democrat leaders these days, is incompetence more so than malevolence. Um, you know, from the incompetence standpoint, and and just playing partisan politics, you know, when Joe Biden got into office. He basically just wanted to do anything that was the opposite of what Trump did. So if Trump was strong on the border, he wanted to be weak on the border. Um, and any type of action that Biden did that was objectively wrong and wasn't working, they defended it just like any other politician would. So I think part of that is incompetence. Now, I do think that there is an effort to kind of keep it going by some of them as to why um, money. I think there are a lot of lobbying interests, um, maybe not necessarily on the national level, but on the local level. You know, um, I'm near New York City, and you know the hotel lobby loves this. Uh, you know, they lost a ton of money during COVID because of lack of tourism, and all of a sudden they got guaranteed money, uh, inflated prices that they wouldn't have never made. 100% occupancy rates uh, for some of their hotels. I mean money is definitely a huge factor and they're one of the strongest lobbies within the city and within the state i should say so i mean money is definitely a big part of it there are lots of people who are making money off of this situation adam you have a great piece up in the telegraph talking about something i've been concerned about for quite some time our enemies exploiting the fact we have an open border it's not just that we have an open border it's that everybody knows it so any tom dick and harry coming from anywhere can come pouring across that border. We got Chinese men pouring across the border. Who knows what they're doing here? It's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's the most obvious reason why you'd want to have a secure border. It's quite literally as a child who watched, uh, you know, our, our Twin Towers go down uh, because of uh, terrorists coming into our country. And we're supposed to learn this hard lesson about security, right? Well, here we are saying that the border is just this invisible line. And what does that even mean anymore? You know, um, you know we have to become the, the safety net for the entire world and take our, our, our eye off the ball when it comes to security. But security is a really, really big issue. There are a lot of people who do not like us. As Mitch, is there are a lot of countries that do like us and like working with us. There are a lot of countries that don't like us. And there are a lot of... Um, you know, organizations, small terrorist organizations that do not like us. So, you know, in that piece, I'm highlighting how um, there is an ISIS component when it came to the attacks in Russia. And what's there to stop them from coming after us? We are incredibly vulnerable. And, I, and in the piece, I highlight how, you know, the FBI has talked about this. They've caught people who are on the terrorist watch list. Like we know that there is attempts to have these types of people come in. There is a human trafficker with, with ISIS links um, that was helping to bring Uzbek uh, migrants into our, our country. They know about this, right? So the intelligence agencies know that we're incredibly vulnerable. There have been attempts from people who are malicious who have entered our country. Whether they have a plan or don't have a plan, I don't know, but this is a real concern. Adam, I have a theory on something the Democrats are doing with the illegal immigration, because I couldn't figure something out. 
They brought in all these <laughs> illegals. And then when they get shuttled to these Democrat-run cities, where are they putting them? They're putting them in the black neighborhoods. Doing it in Chicago, doing it in New York City. Black people in these neighborhoods are upset, obviously. Now, all of a sudden, you know, the class sizes are huge. The rec centers are gone. They're voicing their displeasure loudly. Yet these dirty commies haven't backed off at all. They're still just shoving them in there. I believe Democrats are moving on to a different voting block. I think they see, at least slowly, their guaranteed black vote going away. Obviously, that's going to be slow. But I think they're simply not worried about it. They're just finding replacements. Am I wrong? Not necessarily. Here's a couple things to think about. We'll use Chicago and New York as an example. Mayor Adams does not like this. Mayor Adams was fighting uh, Joe Biden's administration, even went to D.C. and said, you need to stop and do something about this or you need to pay for this. Right. And D.C. is not given much of anything. So Mayor Adams, in my opinion, he's not the commie type. Um, even in Chicago, there they went to uh, D.C. as well, uh, even though Brandon Johnson is more of the progressive slash commie type, in my opinion, um, he didn't necessarily like this either. And so I think whenever you get crap, you put it in the poor neighborhood. Uh, I think that's just what ends up happening. And within these cities, the poor neighborhoods are black, Hispanic, um, ethnic neighborhoods. And so that's just where people are going. So they filled up the hotels, they fill up the parks. And of course, I mean, they're not going to put it in the wealthy neighborhoods first. Right. I mean, if it comes down to that, that's the that's the last option we'd ever want to do. Right. Because those people go out and vote. Those people, you know, help to support our campaigns. They complain the loudest. Right. I mean, when they complain, it matters more than when poor people complain. But I think that's more so what's happening. It's a reaction to when you're getting an influx of people because managing people is the hardest thing you could possibly do. What are you going to do? Well, you put them in the poor areas first. Because the poor people complain no matter what, and, and if nothing changes, nothing changes for them. But this is the reality. So I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily exactly what you're saying. I think it's just more so of a reaction. Yeah, they shipped him into Martha's Vineyard. They had him out of there in 48 hours. <laughs> exactly. Those liberal white women were crying on the way out the door. <laughs> Adam, exactly. thank you, brother. All right, Christianity. Government's declared war on it. If you can't see it, you're blind. We're going to talk to Aaron McIntyre about that next. Before we talk to Aaron about that, let's talk about what we can do. Look, here's what we very clearly can't do. We can't get these people to stop spending and printing money. It doesn't matter how loud you scream or I scream. Republican, Democrat, they don't care. They're getting ready to meet again in about five minutes and just more gobs of money to Ukraine. Just whatever, everybody, just money for everybody. So you know what's going to happen with the dollar. You're not an idiot. You understand. So all we can do is prepare. Prepare for a future where the dollar isn't worth even what it's worth today. And I know that's bad. We have to prepare for a future where things get really rocky. You prepare the same way nation states are currently preparing, the same way finance giants are currently preparing. You know what they're doing? They're buying gold. They're buying silver. They're snatching up gobs of gold and silver. Let Oxford Gold Group do that for you. No, no, you're not going to be able to buy as much as China. <laughs> Neither can I. Just get something in your hands. And it's not as if it's going to go stale. Even if you don't need it, your kids might. Call Oxford Gold Group, 833-995-GOLD. Let them help you prepare. We'll be back. Pretty dangerous criminals there, right? Scary stuff. And hey, maybe you're worried about running into one of those people tonight on your way to the car to get some bonbons from the gas station. Well, don't worry. 11 of those, or 10 of those people now face 11 years in prison for that crime right there. Joining me now, Aaron McIntyre, wonderful commentator, someone I listen to every chance I get author of the book, The Total State, which you should pick up if you want to understand what we're looking at here. Aaron, 87-year-old survivor of a communist concentration camp, 
going to be thrown in prison for 11 years in the United States of America for singing praise and worship songs, and still half the Christians won't vote in this coming upcoming election. That's where we're at in this country. Well, Jesse, you know well that destroying Christianity is a core goal of any communist regime, whether it be in Spain, Russia, China. They hate Christianity. They know that it serves as a moral alter alternative, another base that shields people from the control of the state, the my, uh, mind control, the brainwashing, the forcing of alien values into places like the home and the sphere of the community. And so obviously they're going to go after these people. It's, it's not hypocrisy. It's hierarchy. The people who are the foot soldiers of the regime, they can go burn down your house. They can go ahead and burn down your church. They can go ahead and burn down your business. But if you're sitting there interrupting something that is sacred to the regime, you're going to jail. Aaron, can you explain the complacency on the right? And I'm not just talking about uh, practicing Christians, but we right now have open religious prosecution courtesy of the DOJ, and they're doing it in response to a Supreme Court ruling they don't like. That's how incredibly corrupt and inappropriate this is. Roe versus Wade gets overturned. The G DOJ declares war on pro-lifers, and the right just doesn't care that much. Why? There's an obsession with process. The right believes in order, and rightly so, right? We want to be the side of order. We want to be the side that follows the rules. That makes perfect sense. Until you realize that the institutions dictating those rules are completely captured. Until you realize that the rules are actually set up in a way not to build up your society, not to protect what you hold as traditional or sacred core to your identity as a people, but instead is set up to destroy those things. And so a lot of conservatives who naturally want to protect their institutions, naturally want to protect the, the rule of law and the order, have no idea how to react when the very institutions that are supposed to protect those things instead turn on them. So they're just sitting around saying, oh, what do we do next? What do we want to do next? Maybe we should just work the process harder. Maybe there's another way we can go ahead and follow the rules and more effectively, and then we'll have our victory. They don't understand that the entire thing has been turned on its head. Aaron, when did it get turned on its head? I'm not old. I, I, I'm, I think I'm probably a little older than you, but I'm 42. But I, I've had a hard time trying to describe recently to my sons, they're 13 and 15, what America was like when I was a kid. I'm not some great grandpa. I'll come bounce on my knees, son, and I'll tell you about 15 cent cheeseburgers. I, I'm trying to explain to them what even television was like. And it's like I'm describing a totally different world. Yeah, the key is really that it has been a slow process. It feels sudden to us now, but that's only because we have a little bit of perspective. If you look over time, you realize that the freedoms of the United States have been shifting for a long time. Most people don't talk about things like the fact that FDR stole all of the gold in the United States. We just don't talk about the fact that that happened because that would be really inconvenient to our understanding of things like the Constitution and rule of law. We don't really address the many different ways in which our government has grabbed for power for a very long time. But now that we've gotten into this radical position where it seems like anything, just a basic expression of faith or disagreement with government policy can be used, can be weaponized by something like the DOJ to destroy your political enemies, all of a sudden it feels like the whole roof is collapsing on top of us. But actually the frog has been boiling in the water. It just was boiling very slowly and has suddenly realized what kind of trouble it's in. Are the American churches going to stand up and do anything about it? This is something I scream about all the time. It's essentially a standing army sitting there that could vote its way right back into complete cultural dominance if it would wake up and they don't seem awake. What's going on? Well, one of the core things that happened to the church is that in things like the 1980s, the moral majority campaigns ended up losing particular parts of the culture war. And the lesson that many pastors took from that was that the involvement of, of, Chris, of Christians in politics is what had made Christianity unpopular. And if only they could evolve with the times and stay away from controversy and show that they were cool and hip and with it, then they would be able to go ahead and draw people back to church. But what we found is that the more the church conformed 
conforms to the world, the less it's interested in involving itself in politics or speaking into important areas, it simply becomes less relevant. It simply becomes just another social organization that people may or may not show up to, which is why many of the mainline Protestant denominations are dying off, while many of the other denominations that demand more of the people that go to their church are the ones that are flourishing. And so I think we will probably not see an overall change in the church's attitude, but we will probably see the churches that are speaking out, the churches that are taking action, the ones that are demanding more, draw people who are interested in change. And that could be a positive development, but I wouldn't expect to see all of Christianity rise up against this, unfortunately. Aaron, you have a piece up about the danger of regime charity. What are you talking about? So uh, Mackenzie Scott, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos from Amazon fame, of course, ended up giving a large amount of money to charity. I think it's something like $16 billion at this point. And a lot of people will look at that and say, oh, that's amazing. It's so great that she's handing out money to charity. And in her eyes, I'm sure she's trying to save the world. But in actuality, what she's doing is handing out large amounts of money to charitable organizations in theory, but in practice, they're actually organizations designed to reinforce the thought process of the regime, the, the, the morality uh, and the norms of the regime. That money is funneled into these organizations and they can do work that the actual government elected officials can't do. So, for instance, when the uh, when the regime wants to go ahead and censor people on social media or get them fired, it would be a violation of the First Amendment, at least in theory, for them to go out and actively pursue that. But these charities can apply pressure to those different groups to try, to try to get that censorship or that firing done under the name of being a charity. And so all of that money seems like it's going to help people, but in many cases what it's actually doing is being donated to the total state, being donated to the powers that be and advancing the progressive worldview. Uh, Aaron, thank you, my brother. Hey, by the way, before you go, the total state, what's it about? Total state is a lot about what we just talked about, that expansion of government power into these places that are not traditionally thought of as political, as being part of the state, but end up consuming all of our personal spaces and driving us all towards this hyper-politicalization -politi that distorts the Constitution. Go get it. The total state, everybody. Aaron, I appreciate you as always, man. All right. There is still a massive operation going on in Baltimore. We lost an entire bridge. What happened there? Why is this going to take so long? What's going on? What does this mean for shipping, international shipping? I don't know any of these things, but Ross does. Ross Kennedy is going to join us next and give us an update on that. Let me give you an update on this. Violent crime is obviously up way, way, way up. You know that, and I know that. They'll lie about it now. They're going to stop reporting on things, but... You have eyes, you can see. We are importing more violent criminals and the ones we have right here homegrown, we're turning them loose from jail. It's a bad problem. You have to own your own self-defense. You can't rely on calling the cops when a bad man meets you in a dark parking lot. You have to have something on you that will stop him. So that 25-year-old man who's lived a life of nothing but violence, can you stop him from doing what he wants to you outside of your car tonight? Burn a can, the burn a pistol launcher, the non-lethal pistol launcher. I carry lethal and non-lethal. Everyone should carry non-lethal. I personally love to have both options on me. I carry my pistol, I carry my burna. It shoots pepper balls or tear gas balls. It's legal in all 50 states. No background checks, no permits. Doesn't matter who you are, who, who your daughter is, your, your dad, your mom. Get them a burn a pistol launcher and carry it on you. And they're fun to shoot. They're fun to practice with. Do it right in your backyard. Pop, pop, pop with the whole fam. 10% off. B-Y-R-N-A. Burna.com slash Jesse. Go get one. We'll be back. Well, I know you're worried about this Baltimore bridge that came down and shipping and everything else going on, but fear not. Joe Biden is going to Baltimore on Friday. Let us hope he has all kinds of extra Secret Service protection in that town. So joining me now, because we don't have access to Biden's expertise just yet, 
is my friend Ross Kennedy, founder of Fortis Analysis, and he actually is an expert on all things shipping and whatnot. Ross, I understand you are on location in Baltimore as we speak. Are you currently being robbed? I am not currently being robbed. Uh, now I'm at Sparrows Point right now, very uh, safe area of the city. Uh, just left the Incident Command Center here a little bit ago and uh, kind of got a flavor for what's, uh, you know, for what's happening, what some of the challenges are, progress being made. It's been, a, uh, been an interesting day so far, and it's certainly not over yet. Okay, Ross, give us a breakdown, those of us who don't understand shipping, international shipping, bridges, things like that. What are the challenges? Because I'll be honest, brother, every person I talk to, especially over the past few days, all they're telling me is, wow, this is challenging. Wow, this is bad. This is going to take longer than I thought. I have not heard one positive report on, hey, we're moving things along and things are going great. What's happening on the ground? So there's, uh, you know, the good progress that's being made right now. You're seeing, uh, you are starting to see some assets mobilize and move in. Uh, Incident Command Center is, is fully up and running. Uh, certainly special compliments to, uh, to Governor Moore here in, in Maryland really has stepped in a way you don't always see uh, state level leadership do to uh, help make sure that, you know, resources are moving, uh, that, that, you know, positive messaging is going out about it. Uh, really some of the biggest challenges that they're having here though, is the fact that there's still a uh, disintermediated, if you will, kind of chain of command happening where uh, a lot of activity is happening inside different silos. They're having to bring it back together. There's not yet what seems to be kind of a, uh, a clear operating picture, you know, of, of the entire challenge. You have uh, the vessel itself that has to be salvaged. There is a, uh, a salvage and marine recovery uh, group that's working on that. They've got divers down right now. They're utilizing aerial imagery uh, to help kind of keep a, a clear line of sight to things. But then you have a second company that's doing the, the salvage and recovery effort on the a uh, larger part of the bridge that's actually in the water. So you've got two different companies working in the same area, solving, you know, in, in different ways for some of what the same issue is. And then really above all of that, you have the Port Authority uh, and you have stakeholders uh, from the different terminals, uh, trucking companies as well. Uh, so there's a lot of people that don't, you know, that, that have skin in the game, but don't necessarily have uh, a voice, if you will, to be heard as far as what, how their operations, their businesses are being impacted by all of this. Uh, and it really seems like we're still kind of weeks away from all of these entities talking to each other the way they should. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that last part because that's really my next question, Ross. In fact, it's a two-part question. Who's in charge and who's paying for all this? Is this the U.S. government? Is this Maryland? This certainly is not going to be an exclusively private matter, at least I don't think, although you can obviously correct me on this. But as you well know, there needs to be one dude in charge, and it doesn't sound like that's the case. So a large part of the recovery effort is being uh, currently uh, managed and, and checks are being distributed uh, by the Navy. Uh, so they have an individual that's on scene that's primarily going to be concerned with uh, trying to understand what the resources are, uh, and then moving the dollars through uh, the public and private center sector entities uh, that, that you know have the ball. They're they're the ones putting the cranes in. They're the ones putting divers in the water that are you know doing the cutting of the metal. Um, on the private sector side, as far as you know funds, uh, you know the insurance provider uh, and and you know local stakeholders, if you will, that are directly involved with the vessel, uh, they're going to be paying for uh, the the vessel recovery itself. But really, their, their checks stop when you get, as you can see in the photo that you guys are putting up now, there's about 4,000 tons of steel on top of the bridge. And that all requires uh, experts who are uh, you know, cutting, welding, underwater diving. But their, their one mission in life is to get this vessel refloated and moved out of the way so the larger recovery effort that's being paid for by the Navy uh, and implemented through the private sector with some Coast Guard, Army Corps of Engineers uh, you know, involved in that as well. So there's several buckets of money that, that are all kind of involved here and everybody's kind of trying to figure out where does your lane of effort you know, end and thus your pile of money and where does mine begin and my pile of money. And uh, th there's still some real, I think, confusion around uh, how that's going to look and, and you know, when one check writing authority turns off and another one turns on. Uh, and that really seems to be a big part of the challenge right now. 
And that leads me to the private companies. As you mentioned, a major port like this, I, I believe it's top 15, top 10 in the United States of America, tens of billions of dollars flow through there. There's a lot of private interests with a lot of money flowing back and forth that's not currently floating back, or flowing back and forth, Ross. How, what do they do? If, if I've got uh, uh, Kelly's cheeseburgers and we run shipping out of that port, how am I getting right? That's right. So... On the other side of the uh, of the bridge disaster, if you will, sort of, uh, you know, that secret terminal that's uh, like where Ports America, for example, operates the largest container terminal here. Uh, they're they're effectively at a full standstill as far as waterborne operations. Uh, however, uh, CSX uh, Railroad has set up a. Uh, they're trying to get to it daily, but it's it's really kind of every couple of days now. Uh, about a hundred uh, containers at a time coming out of the port of New York. Uh, the Port of Norfolk has jumped in and, and activated a, uh, a small vessel service that's running coastwise, uh, you know, being able to bring containers up. Uh, but the big challenge there is, is that all of your uh, on water capacity to be able to lift containers and move them to shore is on the wrong side of the bridge issue. Uh, so you, ha you do have uh, Trade Point here, Trade Point Americas. Uh, th that's the facility I'm sitting outside of right now, about to go in and uh, talk to some individuals there and understand what their challenges are and you know what we can do about it. Uh, this facility is capable as far as having the space to do it, but they don't have the cranes available. And it's also become kind of the staging location where a lot of the metal they are starting to cut and move on barge. They're just kind of having to lay it right there, uh, you know, on the pad, uh, on the water, if you will. So there's still not the right kind of resources that are coming in from the private sector side or the right questions in a lot of cases aren't even being asked. There's only a couple of companies that are trying to do all this planning as far as, you know, who's, who's all the stakeholders? What do they need? What assets and resources do they need? And right now the, the effort is so focused on refloating the vessel and beginning to remove pieces of the bridge that the economic stakeholders here, you know, Amazon has got a huge distribution center behind me. You've got the car terminal as well, where a lot of the roll-on roll-off work is being done. These guys are trying to utilize their resources as best as possible to be of assistance, but it's it's often forcing their own economic interests to take a back seat. And so that's really where a lot of the effort, you know, people are trying to come in, they're flying in, they're doing what they can to try to be a part of the actual, you know, salvage effort on the water. But at the same time, there's billions of dollars in economic activity here whose voices aren't being heard. The questions aren't being asked of what do you need, who can provide it, and how do we get it here? So a lot of the work that I'm doing here is trying to interface with these individuals and these organizations to try to bring some private sector solutions to the table where private sector is solving for its own challenges. Okay, uh, Ross, to wrap this up, explain this to me. Yes, as, I know it's a stupid question, I'm sorry, but why don't we have more ports? I mean, I could pull up a map of America right here and there's all this ocean. Why, why, why don't we have ports everywhere? Well, a big part of the challenge is, is that over the last 20 to 30 years, as, as the U.S. has become less and less and less export dependent as far as economics, uh, more and more and more import dependent, these vessels are getting much larger. They require, you know, what we call a draft, which is the ability to operate below the waterline, how deep a vessel can go. And this is really driven the case of we only have a relatively few. I mean, we, we have some of the largest uh, in terms of miles coastline in the world as a country. And so we have three shores that we can operate off of, but we really only have a few places that actually have enough uh, natural or you can dredge to a certain depth to be able to service these much larger vessels. When you're moving the much larger vessels, you need a lot longer cranes that have the ability to reach further out onto the ship and pick the containers off and bring them safely back to shore. Then you need an awful lot of lay down space or, or you know, concrete pads where you can put the containers, you can stack them, you can mount them to chassis and trucks and be able to get them moving. So as the ships have gotten bigger, as the corridors that these containers can move through on rail to move to the inland or where trucks can have the room to come in and pick up and maneuver, all of that means you need more and more and more space. You need larger and larger and larger equipment. And that prices out a lot of opportunities to where you could do short sea shipping, smaller vessels, higher speed, reduced amount of infrastructure required and begin to spread that effort. So the consolidation in size is really what's driving a lot of these challenges for how can we only have a few ports? Well, it's because there's relatively only a few places that can afford to do it uh, for, from an infrastructure standpoint.
Gosh, I feel so much smarter now. Ross, as always, my brother, I appreciate you. You stay safe back there. All right. Now, before we go to lighten the mood, I want to remind you that the whole COVID stuff, the lockdowns, the whatnot, it reshaped our country. We're still seeing it everywhere. We have a special on COVID, on the reckoning, why we need one, a recap on everything. You're going to be able to catch that tomorrow, so stay tuned for that, all right? All right, we have Light in the Mood next. All right, it's time to lighten the mood. And you know, we talk a lot about superpowers. If you're a dude, you talk about superpowers for sure. And I have two teenage sons, so believe me, superpowers come up from time to time. And I have this weird one that I want, and no one understands it until you start driving, and then you understand it. I should say my sons don't get it yet, but they will. You know what superpower I want? I want the superpower when I'm driving to pick a car and just safely, I don't want anyone to be hurt, shut that car down and force them to the side of the road where they have to stay for 15 minutes. That's what I want. I don't want anyone hurt, no one in the car, but I just, boo, you're shut down for 15 minutes. You know why? Because many people are inconsiderate on the road. They drive around as if they're the only people on the road, and I can't stand it. So when I see videos like this, it just, it nourishes my soul.